Welcome to this wonderful evening of uh, redefining the art of aging well. And as, uh, as your uh, sheets tell you, this is uh, a lively discussion, what we're sure is going to be a lively discussion in a truly inspiring setting. Um, we'll start uh, at the very end of the row here, uh, Jackie Scarcello. Uh, Jackie's a leadership consultant uh, and also uh, featured in Zoomer magazine, as you came in, if you saw the article. Uh, her career has spanned North America and continues to span North America. And she's been intimately involved in the working lives of baby boomers, right from their very first steps into their very first career to those midlife changes and on into retirement. And in 2006, facing her own 55th birthday, ja Jackie asked herself the question, what's a woman's role in society after menopause? And being an enterprising kind of person, she traveled to five different countries and interviewed women from 45 to 102 years old to get her answer, and the result is the book 50 and Fabulous, uh, The Best Years of a Woman's Life. And it's a book which has been credited with nudging women over 50 from uh, worry to wonder, from futile to fertile, from downward to homeward in only 224 pages. So well worth the read. So well, thank you, Jackie, welcome. Next to Jackie is Marilyn Lightstone. Marilyn was born in Montreal where she encountered her first audience and fans, her parents. Uh, and happily for us, uh, she branched out uh, and she earned her bachelor degree at McGill University and was an early grad of the National Theatre School of Canada. And her work, quite frankly, is part of the cultural fabric of Canada. Uh, no doubt you recognize her face from um, some of the many, many productions that she's been involved in. She is an award-winning actress, uh, an artist, a singer, an author, and now a radio host. Uh, and her life and her career are truly a tribute to her creativity, her talent, and her zest for living and uh, as well as her ability to live as herself authentically. And she has, is a fabulous role model for following her heart. So welcome, Marilyn. Uh, right next to Marilyn is Susan Brunt, who was born to be a doctor. Um, and uh, lucky for those fortunate, fortunate enough to be her later patients, uh, she moved on from the practice of her childhood years, which was largely focused on her dolls. Um, and throughout the course of her career, she has impacted and continues to impact the lives of hundreds of people, certainly across the GTA. Her listening, her wisdom, her kindness, and her humor are as central to her practice as are her uh, wisdom and her skill and her dedication. Her philosophy, which is a wonderful one to follow, is embrace the day, good or bad. Surround yourself with people you love and who love you. Work hard and play harder beautifully captured in her portrait here. So welcome, Susan. <laughs> oh, it's just the start of the tears. Um, Mary Shepard is an award-winning journalist and author, uh, and she has been a journalist in print, radio, television, and online for 30 years, more than 30 years. And in her mid-40s, she packed up and took her family and went to Europe and wrote her first of three teen books, Seven for a Secret. And uh, she's currently on sabbatical in her role as executive producer at CBC uh, and until January. And she's doing that in order to write her fourth novel, to travel to Peru, as we discovered uh, during our conversation earlier, uh, and also to take some time uh, to catch up on her own reading uh, and gardening as well. So welcome, Mary. And then, of course, Tina Dolter, whose work uh, surrounds us this evening. Um, she's been drawing and painting since she could hold a pencil. And uh, 25 years into her, into her career, she went back to university to study visual art and was awarded the Memorial University Medal for Academic Excellence. No surprise when you see what's here. And her subjects largely reflect women, women's issues, family, identity, and place. And she expresses these through a variety of media, oil painting, drawing, printmaking, and photography. And uh, we can find her, her moving works of art, not just here uh, in the Propeller Gallery, uh, but also in many corporate and private collections uh, as part of the permanent connection of the Grenfell Campus Art Gallery, the teaching collection of the print department of Grenfell Campus Visual Arts Department, and the art procurement program of the Art Gallery of Newfoundland and Labrador. Welcome and thank you all. So we're here to talk about uh, women and aging well. And why do we even need to have this discussion? Well, um, that is a very good question. Why do we need to have this discussion? Uh, during my artistic practice, when I went back to university, I was in my 40s when I graduated. And uh, as many of you might have heard, I did get involved in a calendar project to raise money for my local hospital. And all the women were over 40, and they were fantastic. And, but the one thing that they, all, that they kept talking about was the fact that they started to feel invisible once they hit 40. 
And I kept hearing that. It was recurring over and over again. And these were gorgeous, fabulous women, but not just physically beautiful. It's just this light shone from, from within. And I think it's really important to have this discussion because we need, we need to draw attention to the fact that we do have that light within us. I try to do it in my journalism, but to remember that uh, lives go on and, and they become fuller. Women become more content, I feel, as they get older. And I just think it's important to discuss this and to uh, come to an understanding of how important it is to continue with our stories. Okay, well, uh, just, just to follow up on what you said, Mary, I sort of see the after the as well in my practice, um, sort of day in and day out. And as I've sort of matured in my practice, so as my practice matured with me, and certainly I think um, people's lives have become more interesting, more rich, uh, more challenging sometimes, but um, it's really, I think, seeing, feeling myself sort of blossoming as I age, seeing my patients in my practice sort of do the same thing and also seeing it in my friends. So I think there's lots of stories. You can only avoid things so long before you have to address them. And um, even though I chose not to fight the feminist battle in the usual way, or the artist battle in the usual way, I realized that we all fight it every day. And um, I guess we're gonna have another round after this. So I'm gonna leave it there. But for me, it goes way, way back to monotheism and patriarchy. Um, I think that um, the reason we need to have this discussion um, is that longevity is the topic of the day. We are living longer. The, the age of menopause has always been the same through history. So it's always been around 49 to 51 years of age. So we used to die, quite frankly, before we got through menopause. Um, then we lived a few years after it. And then we lived a few more, but, but not enough to really think about the quality of life. Our children, my daughter, for instance, could very well live as long after menopause as she does before. So the quality of life in that stage of life is very, very important. And right now, there's so much negativity around aging, whether it be overt or whether it be subtle, that we're engaging in this stage of life as if it was a second-class stage of life, either, again, overtly or either subtly in our heads, that's what we're thinking. And so I think we need to look at what is aging and what is the definition of aging and how the values that we have about it, do they really suit us anymore and do we believe them? So take them out of the closet, take a look at them, and see if uh, we need to change them. Because I personally don't want to live 40 years in a second class stage of life. So question is, is this, are the portraits here, which are beautiful portraits, beautiful, vibrant portraits, are, is this one of the doorways into the conversation, that it is a doorway about, about beauty and the shifting, how beauty starts to look? Is that where we start in the conversation? When Tina asked me if I wanted to pose, of course, as every other woman in this room who has posed for her, we realized, well, how am I going to present myself? How much am I going to show? And uh, the fact is, it's, we're talking about sensuality rather than sexuality, although sexuality is certainly part of sensuality, but it's more than that as well. And I decided I wanted to do a vanity portrait. I saw an, an exhibition at the Tate Gallery many years ago, and they're great big, huge portraits, um, much larger than life side by Van Dyke and all sorts, you know, glorious old masters. And they all show these kings and knights and what's on, and, and queens and kings flaunting it. They were just out there, just looking fabulous. And it made a tremendous impression on me. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just put on all the jewelry I own and just kind of bear as much as I feel comfortable with and kind of just sit there and kind of say, here I am, deal with it. But I do want to react to this, uh, to what Marilyn was saying about uh, being afraid. Um, when I was 16 in high school, the, uh, I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, so it was nuns, and I wanted to put in the yearbook that I wanted to be a journalist. And so the woman, the, the nun who was the, uh, uh, the, the editor of the yearbook came up, pulled me out of class and said, Mary, you can't put this in the yearbook. Well, what's wrong with it? She said, you can be a teacher, you can be a nurse, or you can be an airline stewardess. And I said, well, I don't want to be any of those. And she says, well, you don't even know what a journalist is. And I said, but I do know what a journalist is, and that's what I want to be. 
I said, shit, she went off in a huff. So it was funny, I was looking at my yearbook last night. I don't know why I pulled it off the shelf, but I did. And uh, I'm the only one in the yearbook without an ambition, just blank. You know, <laughs> she, she couldn't win, she didn't want me to win. Uh, anyway, I did go on to be a journalist. I was fortunate enough to get a full scholarship to Columbia University and, uh, you know, straight out of a small town in Newfoundland and uh, went on to do quite well with my, you know, working at McLean's and CBC, Women's Television Network, uh, teaching at Ryerson, etc. But I also want to talk about my portrait a little bit uh, in that uh, when I was approached about it and um, my sister actually called, she was the in-between person between myself and Tina, and she said, Would, you know, do you mind if I put your name forward? And so, yeah, sure, that's fine, but, just, but there's one catch. And I said, well, what's that? She said, well, you gotta take your clothes off. I, I said, oh, <laughs> that is a bit of a catch. Uh, so I said, well, you know, I said, she decides, right? And she said, yes, yeah, she decides. And so I said, well, put my name down, and we'll see what happens. So anyway, we did go forward, but right up until Tina arrived at my door for the sitting, I really wasn't sure what I was going to wear, and I wasn't really sure that I wanted to take anything off. And so it was interesting that we did come to something that I think is fully clothed, but it's also quite sensual. Uh, so it does show that you know a woman can be quite sensual without having to uh, show anything, really. Um, so I, uh, I'm a family doctor, and I love what I do. And I really, I think, have been very lucky because I never felt that there was ever going to be an obstacle in my way to becoming a doctor, which was incredibly naive, probably, but, and never felt anyone sort of saying, well, maybe you should be something else, or maybe you should be a nurse, or maybe you should be a, a, a flight attendant or a teacher. So, but I think where I felt the, the pressure to maybe be something else was more in my personal life and in my, the, the path that I chose you know, I didn't get married, I have a child, um, but I always sort of felt that maybe that wasn't something maybe I wanted to talk about quite so much. So, you know, I think it can, there's many ways that that has played into all of our lives, whether it's professionally for you with the journalism, for you with your choices in various areas of your life, and for me in my personal life. Um, my portrait, I guess, in fitting with my philosophy, she, uh, Tina asked me late night at the Legion in Woody Point, Newfoundland one night, uh, <laughs> yeah, if uh, I'd like to sit for her. And I went, yeah, great idea, love to. <laughs> and then uh, a few days later, I went, oh, I'm not so sure about that. And, uh, you know, sort of thought, wow. And I actually got quite nervous about it before it happened in the day she arrived for the sitting. I was I surprised myself because I thought, oh, you know. And I was really apprehensive, and I think it was the whole concept of putting myself, my body out there. And I think that's another big part of this is the changes in your body as you age, being comfortable with that, um, not feeling that you have to, you know, lift everything, tuck everything, hide everything, Botox everything, you know, have filler. And so that was a bit of a revelation for me to realize that kind of I hadn't really come to terms with that part of the aging process, but maybe I think in sitting for the portrait, I, I have kind of, I don't know, resolved some of that. But anyway, I didn't bear myself too much because I was petrified it would, <laughs> said my patients would be looking at me naked on a website. <laughs> <laughs> so Jackie, you don't have a portrait here, but we do have a picture of you. Um, but your relationship with this stage uh, of your life at this point. My personal relationship with this stage. Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole topic of invisibility is the thing that got me started on the book in the first place, because I started to hear some of my female clients saying to me, I feel invisible in the workplace, and I couldn't understand that. And then some of my peers said, I'm starting to feel invisible. And I thought, this is, this is ludicrous. These women are at the peak of experience, the peak of, I think, potential, and I couldn't understand where that word came from, and I realized that I was feeling the same thing myself a little bit. I mean, it was, it was really resonating um, with me as well. And so I wanted to understand what that invisibility was about. And, and that's why I went out and started asking questions um, of women um, between the ages of 45 and 102. And the personal journey to that for me was I said, well, I'm gonna ask these questions, who am I gonna ask? And since I was a child, 
an older woman with what I describe as sparkling eyes has been to me the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, it has not been youth and beauty, but an older woman. And as a matter of fact, the more wrinkled they get and the older they look, the more the eyes sparkle. And, and I think just going back to what you said about this is the entry point, um, these pictures show that. There is, there is physical beauty on the outside in these pictures, but it is it's the eyes, the life, the experience, the vibrance, um, something inner in the flame um, that comes through in all these pictures and that came through in the women I interviewed. And, and when I asked people, do you know anyone like this? Everyone I knew knew one, someone. Everyone knows an older person that sparkles. And they said, well, you know, they're not that easy to get along with. <laughs> and I said, well, that's right. That's the kind of person I want to interview. <laughs> because they're not. And I, I think this, you know, the issue about us feeling comfortable in our skin, I think as we get older, we start to feel more comfortable. I mean, I, you know, I was thinking today, am I that comfortable in this body I have now? Well, you know, I have more weight than I've ever had. I mean, I sometimes look in the mirror and think, I should spray starch and iron that face, you know. Um, I did not listen to my mother. I did not put the moisture cream on when I was young. But I wouldn't trade that body that I used to have, which I didn't appreciate then either. Let's point that out. When I was 17, I didn't think, you know, that, that was a great body. Um, but I wouldn't trade it for the new voice I feel I have, um, for the new confidence I feel I have. And, and for what I think is comfort in my own skin, that I don't think I've ever felt such comfort in my own skin as I have now. And, and that's certainly what I heard from these women I interviewed as well. So, you know, the body changes, it's external, you know, that's, and, and it's great and some bodies weather better than others, but, but that sparkle, if you look for that sparkle and, and I, you know, I'm, Looking forward to, to finding that sparkle in myself and thinking it's going to look better if the face gets more wrinkled. No. So, you know, we have this amazing range of experience on this panel because, uh, you know, we've got Marilyn, you who, like, from the very beginning, just, you know, if that's the rule, I'm going this way. And uh, with, it sounds like great support. And with Mary, your more quiet sort of way of moving forward. And in your own question for yourself, what is it like to be one of those women whose eyes sparkle? For, for you, Tina, I mean, you had the opportunity to meet some pretty amazing women, uh, both th through this, the portraits you created here, but also, also through your own work and your own life, yourself, mm -hmm. as an amazing woman. What are you noticing about how living into your own skin shifts as you get older? Well, my own personal experience, um, I don't feel like I'm, huh. I didn't become myself, let's say, until I hit 40. I, I think, and to speak to something that Marilyn said that really tweaked with, tweaked with me, and the fact that we hold ourselves back as women and don't give ourselves permission to be our true selves, um, that we allow ourselves to be uh, subjugated and whatnot. I had a very different life from uh, in my late teens and early 20s. We always seem to, to want to be the good girls and to please everybody, keep everybody happy, whether it be our parents, whether it be our siblings, our boyfriends and our husbands and our children. And we don't give ourselves permission to grab and be who we really, who we truly are. And it wasn't until I made some drastic life-changing experiences and uh, moved with my two boys back with my parents um, in my late 30s and uh, went back to university and whatnot, that I found my strength and I found my voice. And um, I'd always been artistic, but had always been, always downplayed it. And even portraiture in that, because I found I was very fortunate as an artist, I find it very easy to do portraiture and to do figure, figure work. And I always was striving, oh, that's not good enough, that's too easy. I gotta, you know, always downplayed my gifts. And we all have gifts. Every one of us has a different gift. And it's an awful thing for us to hide that gift, not only from ourselves, but from everyone else that can grow from our gift. And we have a responsibility, as each and every one of us, as being gifted, that we need to share that. And quite often, we don't give ourselves permission to do that until we're mature enough and we have that calm confidence within ourselves that, that getting older gives us, um, that, that give, gives us permission to do that. And I think, uh, I, don't, I hope I've answered your question, but uh, I know um, when I turned 52, 
I wouldn't take back any of those years from my 20s. And you're so right, like you didn't appreciate your body. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter how thin you were, it wasn't good enough or, you know? And now it's like, I love being my age and I love, and I can't wait to get older. And as an artist, I look at the faces of older people and there's such beauty and there's such character in those faces that uh, I would not, you know, I wouldn't trade it for, I, I'd rather do older people any day of the week than do, do younger. They're too perfect. There's no beauty in perfection. The beauty's in the imperfection and we're all imperfect. So it's, and, and we're all beautiful. Well, I think the beauty in aging, uh, generally for, I'll, I'll talk for women. Um, I think the beauty in aging, again, I think, I'm just gonna reiterate what everyone else has said. I think it's that comfort of living in your own skin. Um, you kind of know who you are. Um, you've either had, I think for women, you've had your, you've had your children or decided not to have children. You've probably had a major relationship. You've kind of got that, I was just thinking about that when he was talking, kind of got some of that stuff done. And now it's time for you to, I think, sort of fully realize yourself. Sounds like such a cliche, but um, you have the time, you have the confidence, you have the knowledge. You have the experience, you know, you've had the ups and the downs, the good and the bad. You've kind of figured out who you are and what makes you tick. And I think that is the beauty of aging. I think that's what we all wear in these portraits is that knowledge. Yeah, I, much the same as Tina uh, and Susan, um, I think I was 50 before I finally had time to think about who I was uh, because uh, anybody who's had children, you know, and a, and, a, and a career that takes a lot of time and then writing books on the side, um, it just consumes your life to do all of that. So, uh, I mean, I had my first daughter when I was 30. So by the time I was 50, she, I had another one eight years later, so the younger one was still at home. But by the time I was 50, I think was the, was the time of my life where I could actually start doing some of the things that I wanted to do for myself. Uh, and I think we all go through that. I don't think that's unique to me. I think it's, it's part of the life cycle. And so that's the beauty of aging, is that you get to a point in your life where those you know, hairy days are behind you uh, and you can stop and reflect. Um, I, one of the terms that we use uh, when I was often counseling people on next career moves uh, at the CBC, one of the things we'd often say, somebody would come in and say, well, I've been offered this job and I don't know what to do. There's this other thing I want to do. And we'd often say, well, you know, this train is in the station. You might as well get on. In other words, this is your opportunity the other opportunity may not present itself. So now I feel that I'm at a stage in my life where I can in fact choose whether I'm going to get on that train or not. Whereas I think up until maybe I was 50 or so, I felt that the train was here, the next promotion was offered, I better take it because maybe another promotion wouldn't come along and yes, I think I want to do this and yes, I like it uh, and so on and so on. But now I can make some of those decisions about yes, I know they want me to do the job, but do I want to do the job? So that's what you get as you get more experience and, and you find out who you are. Thank you. Jackie. Um, when I was interviewing the women, after I finished interviewing them, I took the answers to their questions and I plotted them out by age from 45 to 102. And this amazing phenomenon that I've heard a lot of you, I think, speak to um, became apparent to me. And, and that was, and this is hard to do while I'm holding the mic, um, <laughs> that if you think of life as starting at the broad end of this triangle back here, when you're young, you have a lot of freedom, you have a lot of spontaneity, you don't have too many shoulds when you're very young. You just do things, you don't worry about what people think of you. And then as we age, we start moving in to a point. And, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I think that that's what life in, in our societies requires. I mean, it's a, it's a building, it's a, an acquiring, it's a moving towards goals, but it also means that we start listening to the shoulds and how are we supposed to act and how do other people want us to act. And I think women are particularly susceptible to that. Um, and what I found in my interviews was that after 50, this point flips back out. So at 50, you're right back here again at this, this very narrow point. So it's not too much there, maybe 50 to 60 a little bit, and then 60 to 70 a little bit more, until you're back out into this incredible, what I call open field in the very senior years. That is stunningly beautiful. And, and one of my favorite comments from the women I interviewed was 
that life is a journey from and to freedom. And, and I think that's what we're describing. And I think that that power and that voice and that knowledge comes, and it comes in this opening and opening field, which is not to say that older people are childlike, because it's, it's very different. It is not childlike naivete, and I, I think I call it elegance, which is, which is very different um, at this end. Jackie, question for you from Rose. Yeah. I heard you speak about uh, women uh, feeling invisible. I've heard other panelists talk about voice, not having voice, finding voice. And I'm curious to know, among all the women you've interviewed, uh, what is the connection or lack of connection between feeling invisible, uh, not having a voice? Where is the place for voice of women in aging years? Uh, because I'm not quite sure I understand what you're saying. And I think there's something really important about having voice. And when women say there to you that they were feeling invisible, was it also about not having voice? And where do aging women find voice? Okay, thank you, very good question. Um, the invisibility was a, a sense that they weren't being heard um, when they were speaking up that people weren't paying attention the way they used to. Um, and I, I speculate in my book some reasons why that might be, but, but to answer your question, the women I interviewed who were the sparkling-eyed women, they felt that and they went on, just like we're saying. They just, they went on. Um, they realized uh, when they checked in with themselves, and I think this is the key, you check in with yourself and say, well, who am I now? I mean, so I feel invisible, but who am I? Because, you know, we grow and we don't notice we're growing. You know, we're too busy living and doing and giving to notice what we've become. So you check in with yourself and you find out what you've become and you have this incredible um, harvest to, to nourish the rest of your life. And, and so the invisibility, it doesn't really matter if that's what other people are projecting to you. You just keep going with this new strength that you have when you realize uh, what you've become as you age. And so it becomes a very, a very natural thing. So the women I interviewed, it, it was no longer an issue for them at all. As a matter of fact, I don't think aging was an issue for them. Um, it had been, you know, they kind of looked at it, but they checked in, they'd said, okay, this is who I am, this is what happens, and I'm just gonna keep going. And in, in their own ways, which were very varied, uh, they were doing that. I find that, that as we age, we turn to other women for our support and for our nurturing and for our humor and for a, a lot of that. And I think that's one of the beautiful things for women about aging is instead of competing, which I think we do a lot as younger women, we compete with other women, we actually um, seek strength from each other. We unite, and I think that's one of the beautiful things. So that was- Can I ask you, I um, you know, you must have thought about it a lot before you start with such a major project. Um, could you expand a little bit how you come to the decision of Doing this, doing this project, that was one thing that I really wanted to key into was the power of the feminine, that, that mystical something, that ethereal quality that women have. And that only comes to you, that realization only comes to you as you mature as, as later in life. And again, when you, when you stop competing with each other over men because of that drive to procreate, uh, <laughs> we don't care about that anymore. Um, and, and you truly become like this, this sisterhood and sharing this inner life and part, this whole project to me was sharing this, this inner life with each, between me and my sitters because we were collaborators um, then, and also sharing it with, with all the viewers, both men and women. And I, I, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of men tell me how moved they've been by this project and how it's actually affected them and how they feel about their wives and going back and, and, and seeing their wives in a whole new light and, and truly seeing their, their beauty, um, their true beauty from within. So one of the great things about listening to this is that it can sound as, it sounds as though that, you know, the opportunities around aging is to discover beauty, is to discover the freedom, discover who you are, and it can sound quite magical. And the other thing about us as a species and as, about us as a gender is that if we're not feeling that way, we may feel we're doing it wrong. Uh, we haven't got the sparkle. So, you know, we're going to go home, look in the mirror, and like, it's not there. Um, so for those of us who, who don't feel particularly sparkling, Jackie, you talked about that uh, the women you interviewed had, had still had to come to terms with things. What were some of the things they had to come to terms with? 
Well, most of all, they had to become aware. Um, when I asked questions, they would say, well, well, I never thought about it, but, but now that you mention it, yeah, I, I do feel more confident than I ever have before. And then again, they'd say, well, I didn't think about it, but now that you ask. So what I realized was that they were unaware of how they had changed. They were unaware of how they had grown. And that's actually one of the reasons why I included the questions at the end of the book, the questions that I asked, so that people could ask each other these questions. You have, with a girlfriend, you could sit down and ask these questions or ask yourself them. So they were, they were coming to terms with, with how they had changed. Um, and I think that that's, that's really, really important because, you know, knowledge, if it's unconscious, is somewhat usable. But if it's conscious, it's much more usable. So this unconscious growth that you've done um, will serve you to some degree. But when you become aware of that growth, then you're able to apply it um, much more broadly. I do have a wonderful network of female friends. I also have a great network of male friends. And uh, we're all human beings. We're all flawed. Um, certainly, we need to support and help one another. And uh, I'm looking forward to perhaps doing the sensuality of the maturing man project <laughs> as time goes on. But my husband says, well, yes, if you can find some men who are maturing, then, then <laughs> yeah. But of course, there, there, there's also that, that you know, I, I know it sounds cliche, but we, we truly do enjoy that aspect of, of, of men is their ability to, uh, to still retain that, that, that inner child. Um, and I think we, we all have, have our inner, inner children as well as, as women and uh, give ourselves permission to, to live that. And that's how I'm going to move forward. Lovely. Thank you. For you, Mary, your advice to yourself, your commitment to yourself as you move forward. Uh, for myself, um, I plan to continue writing strong characters, strong female, older women into my books. Although I write for a teen, the teen audience, they all have strong mothers and many of them have strong grandmothers and uh, ensure that those characters continue to exist. And in my journalism, I certainly would, uh, would continue to ensure that uh, we do stories that bring in the, uh, the female voice. Uh, for example, recently I commissioned a piece on a 90-year-old woman who was sitting on a bench. It was a video piece. It was, uh, she was sitting on a bench in Vancouver and she did have this sparkle. And uh, she really just talked about what it was like to be an activist when she was in her 30s and 40s, and now she was 90. Um, recently, for International Women's Day, for example, uh, you know, we were trying to do something different, as we all journalists do. And um, I decided to do a piece on uh, women in medicine and uh, the fact that although we now have, you know, 50% of the doctors are now women, that in fact uh, not very many women have any power within the medical political structure. So I will continue to do that kind of journalism and, and my writing. Um, I did want to also offer the one piece of advice that I kind of gave to myself when I was 14 or 15 and I was reading Virginia Woolf. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, I came across this sentence in her book and it's always been with me, you know, a woman, an independent woman should have a room of her own and 500 pounds, you know, her own bank account. And I've always advised, I have seven sisters, and I've always advised all of them, you know, have your own bank account. I've always had my, it gives you a certain freedom. Even though there's only $50 in that account, it gives you the freedom that you know you can make some decisions that is separate from the partnership. And if you have a room of your own, and it doesn't have to be a room if you don't have a big place, but it should be a space for yourself that's your space. So those are that, that I've lived my life that way, and I've certainly encouraged my daughters to, to do the same. Thank you. Very excited to hear where you put your portrait in your space, too. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, advice for yourself, a commitment to yourself as you move well, forward? Well, first of all, uh, just to comment on Mary, my grandmother gave my mother the same advice about the bank account, and my mother gave me the same advice, and I've given my daughter the same advice. So it's interesting. Um, I think um, my sort of aim for the future is twofold. One would be to launch my daughter as a strong, independent woman who uh, avoids some of the pitfalls that I hit. Um, and secondly, I think professionally, I, would, I hope that uh, within my professional life that I can help uh, my patients at this, th sort of through this transition. Really, it's a transition time in your life um, so that they can sort of 
realize their potential, find themselves, whatever that that's going to be for them, but to support them through that process. And I think, you know, sort of give that to them. I feel like I've made done something meaningful other than treating strep throat. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Mary I don't know what prompted me to think this, but a few weeks ago, flashed through my head that it never occurred to me that I had to ask permission. So that's my advice. Don't feel you have to ask permission. Just do it, whatever that might be. Jackie, for you, advice to yourself, commitment to yourself as you move forward. Advice to myself. Um, I think the commitment I have is to, um, and the advice to myself, therefore, is to find what I found in the women I interviewed, um, which was this, this sense of wonder um, as they grew older. And also, and I'm almost afraid to say this, I'm afraid Marilyn's going to jump on me, um, the, um, a sense of acceptance. And, and let me explain that, because I do not mean a lie down and get run over sense of acceptance but a sense that this is um, the reality in life, whether it be the changes that are happening in your body, whether it be losses that are coming in your life as you age, um, whether it be any circumstance, um, this is the way it is now, wherever it, it did come from. And um, in the acceptance, um, you find the energy to, to live well in that circumstance and perhaps to do something about it, perhaps to change. But when you do not have the acceptance, you fight against it. And so that's what I'm looking for in my life, the acceptance so I have the energy um, to, to hopefully be um, a voice for older women. And actually, I am just starting to interview older men as well. So I'll meet you on that project there, Tina, if you, <laughs> if you start. <laughs> my husband says if I write a book about men, only women will read it. But um, I'm not so sure about that. I've met some very interesting older men in the interviews so far. So, um, but that, that sense of acceptance, I think, is really, really important because I think that's where our energy comes from um, rather than the resistance, this sense of that there's some universal wrong and it's all wrong and it shouldn't be this way. Um, it's, it, it is that way for whatever reasons, whatever happened, and now we have the power and, uh, and the voice to do something about it. So, that's, that's so what we I'm thank you for. Uh, for your time. And uh, the invitation then is to, uh, you're going to be here for a while. Uh, so to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the panelists if you feel like it. And the wish to our panelists, but to all of us in this room, to live well. Have patience with me. You're a man, of course you're patient. Saturday, good to be Just a joke.